So my name is Christopher Beatty, I work at uh, Lightbend, I work on the ACA team, so we develop core ACA, streams, like HTTP, those things. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick overview of all of the APIs that we've added for ACA Tite. Um, you may think why on earth hasn't, haven't I heard about ACA Tite before, but what we've been doing over the last few months is basically productionizing it, so we're about to do a release where we're saying, hey, you can stick this in production rather than just play about with it at the weekend. So, because we're doing 20 minutes, I'm not going to give you a huge amount of context. It semi assumes you're familiar with Acker. Who is familiar with Acker? Who's played around with Tight? Anyone? A few? It's going to change, it has changed quite a bit. It's changed every commit. I had to change my slides on the, on the way here. Um, I'm going to cover most of the areas of Acker, so, but, mainly the, but I'm going to concentrate on the bits which Acker Tight has uh, affected the most. So, I will show you Tight Actors. Uh, if for the few people who didn't put their hands up, I will show an untyped actor, like before and after kind of thing. I will be doing some clustering, so we'll see how do you look up a typed actor, because you, if you previously used, say, actor selection, which basically given an address, will give you an actor ref, what type would that actor ref be, so there's, there's a new way to do that. Um, streams really aren't affected much. There's a few things where you can go like from a source and a sync from an actor, there's, there's a new API for that, but it's pretty minor are persistence. So I think persistence are one of the areas which have improved the most and we've only really just, just finished it. So because there are essentially three types in flight. You've got messages coming in, you've got things you want to persist and you've got state. Uh, I probably won't have enough time to give context for that. So if, you, if you're not aware of event sourcing terminology or if you haven't seen active persistence, you'll probably be like, what's he talking about? But I'll give you, you can ask me about it after and I'll happily, while people are having pizza, if you want to sit down, have a look at some code, that's fine, fine with me too. So, why are we doing archetypes? Because we're in a static type programming language and it seems like a good idea and it's pretty much what everyone complains about. But it's quite hard. So, even over the last few months when we thought kind of the API was, was nearly done, we, we keep on finding more and more bits where it's actually really hard, hard to add types without introducing a huge amount of boilerplate. Um, I've only been on working for Lightbend for the last uh, few months. I previously used to build stuff with Acker and some of the things rather than build Acker itself. And I certainly haven't found it a huge problem initially, but when I've revisited large projects which use, which use ACA, I've definitely found it problematic. I found it hard to refactor the code, I found it hard to understand some of the tests that I once thought were a good idea, or one of my team members thought were a good idea, and it's kind of hard to very quickly learn how the various parts of your system communicate with each other. You actually have to look at implementation, which, which is a pain. So, I think Archetype does add some boilerplate. And it's all about making um, protocols explicit. So maybe, maybe it's not boilerplate, maybe that's, the, maybe that's the wrong word. But any time you previously relied on something implicit, like uh, using the sender reference, or uh, you decided, hey, I built this perfect actor and it takes this type of messages, but you know, I quickly need to add a feature and it doesn't really matter if I take in a string and an int as a message too. You can't do that with archetypes, unless you type into anything. So I'm just gonna show it by an example. So I'm going to start with an untyped actor, and then we're going to show what it looks like if we turn it into a typed actor. I'm going to build something quite simple, but it's complex enough so you'll see lots of, lots of the features. So I'm going to do something you should never do at home, which is build a distributed lock. Um, the protocol is very simple. Uh, I've decided to define a sealed trait for the messages that I can send to the actor, but of course you don't need to do that in actor typed, in untyped actor even. And essentially I can either ask to lock or I can ask to unlock. And then I'm expecting a message back. And I've got a type for that as well. So we've got a lock status class, and you can either say, hey, the lock's been granted, or no, you can't have it because this other act has taken the lock. And there are quite a few, there's three main ways you could implement that in untyped actor. You can use some mutable state, which I've done here. So what have I done? We've essentially said whether the lock is taken is a, a mutable field. And of course, that's quite dangerous in most scenarios, but one of the big benefits of actors is we get that single-threaded kind of illusion that only one message is going to be processed at any given time. So you don't need to worry about mutual exclusion for accessing a mutable variable. And you also don't need to worry about visibility. So when we receive, you know, message number two, ACA as per a happens before relationship with message number one. Let's have a look at this. Is this easy to understand? Do you think you can come back and look at this code and say kind of, know what it does, I've got some nods, I have no idea what that does. 
Um, I think it is, even with a small example like this, it can be quite hard because you're trying to work out which messages we can receive by looking at a pattern match, which can be kind of hard to, to grok. We kind of, if you look at it close enough, you can see, okay, if it's a non, I accept a lock. Um, if it's a if it's a if it if it's an option, then I accept an unlock. And if someone sends me another lock, I kind of send back it's taken. So I guess most people who've used ACA would probably write it like this or similar to this. They would use become. They get rid of the the mutable state, and you would you would you'd represent it more as some kind of like state <coughs> where you would define individual states. So if we're in unlocked, then we only really care about the lock message, and the other one is unhandled. Or we could handle it and say. What are you doing? Um, and then we transition using become to using the uh, to, to the on to the locked state, and we store our state by you know building this function and doing a become lock to the, the sender class. There's a few things that are going to have to change here, but this pattern is exactly what ACA type looks like. You define your various behaviors, to define which messages for a given behavior you're allowed to receive. You're allowed to send messages. And then finally, you need to return the next behavior. Now, we're doing this with become in two out of the three cases. But if we have a look at the, the lock, this one here, um, when, we're, when we're locked, we are sending a message back saying, you know, the lock is taken, but we're not actually becoming a new state. We're, we're remaining the same state. And we can't do that in archetypes. You have to explicitly say what your next behavior is. What should you do when, the project, when you next receive a message? So what are things we're going to change? So unsurprisingly, actorref in the, is going to become an actorref with a type parameter. And that's it. We're done. No, we're not. Um, <laughs> you're no longer going to have any classes, or certainly not with most of them. You can, you can with the Java API, but in the Scala API, I'd be surprised if you were to use any classes. You're not going to be allowed to use the sender. So if we go back to, this has got a bit of a lag, so I won't go back to. If we go back to the example, we use the sender quite a lot. We use the sender to implicitly tell us which, which actor is trying to take the lock, you know, which, which bit of our system is trying, is trying to take the lock. We can't do that anymore, right? Because what type would the sender be? And the same goes for actor selection. The only things we're allowed to do when we're defining a behavior for archetypes is send messages. So these are the side effects we're allowed. We're allowed to send messages. We don't have to, but we can. We can spawn children. And we have to it says, it change its behavior or return its next behavior. You could return the same thing, that, that, that's fine too, but you have to be explicit about it. So how does the protocol change when doing this in Akatite? Well, we no longer get, for the lock protocol, we no longer get to use case objects uh, because they, we need to actually send the actor ref explicitly. So anytime you want a response from an actor, you're going to have to send in an actor ref so it can respond. And that will be appropriately typed for its response protocol. And the same has happened for, un for unlock as well. We could just say, I'm unlocking it. And our noddy example decided to say, OK, let's make sure the right person is, is unlocking it. We also need to add, um, we don't need to change, sorry, the, the, the lock status protocol a lot. Because for granted, that's fine. That's just a one-way message. We don't need to worry about sending a message back when we've been granted a lock. And the taken one already, already included it. The only, the only difference here is the after ref that it includes has got a type parameter, it's got a lack of this. So we can't just randomly talk to the person who's got the lock now and say, hey man, please, please, please re release the lock. How do you define a behavior? So there's a set of factory methods, and this is what changes on the train. There's a commit which changed the name of this receive function. Um, and essentially, there's a bunch of factory methods for creating behaviors that are essentially just functions. In this example, I'm using receive, and what that does is it's a function which takes an actor context, which allows you to spawn, it allows you to watch and do sort of a few other things, and it takes in the message, and that message has to be obviously the, the type of the actor ref that, it, that, it, that you're creating. And the final thing you do is that function returns a, the next behavior. Here it's locked. What does locked look like? Well, it's similar to, to unlocked, apart from it now takes two, two different messages, so in this state we can process two different messages. One is lock, one is unlock. And in the case of lock, we're explicitly having to say we're, a we're, we're going to remain the same behavior. This message has not changed me at all. But in the case of unlock, then we go back to the unlocked state. Anyone got any questions on that one? No? What, what, what if somebody sent them unlocked message uh, to the first unlock? Okay, good question. So, like the receive one. So that is actually this will actually this this example here will give a compiler warning because 
it's meant to be a total function, um, so this would, this would fail. Uh, if you want, there's a receive partial, if you still want that. But what you should really do is explicitly handle all the cases, get rid of your compiler warnings, and do whatever it is right for you to do, like say, go away, or log an error, or etc. Another thing that's changed quite a bit is an actor system itself is an actor f with a type. So when you, when you actually start up an actor system, you have to give it a top level behavior, which is something which is, becomes the user guardian. Um, and for that, you often want to kick some things off. So there's another factory method on behaviors which is called setup. And what it can do is you get hold of a context to start off with, you get to do some stuff, that stuff being sending messages, spawning children, and then you have to define the behavior that the actor system becomes. And you don't have, you, that could be nothing. You might, you're, you might not want your actor system to actually do, it, do anything or receive messages. So you could do something, there's a, there's a factory method which just gives you none or something, I can't remember its name. Uh, but in this example, because in my setup I ask for a lock, I'm gonna receive the message to say it's granted and then say yay and go do something. Um, I'm gonna show the ask in more detail, so don't worry about the ask too much. And then again, I'm just returning behaviors, but the same. You can also deal with the fact that it could be taken, and I just logged to say I'm really sad that I didn't get the lock. I could here return something like behaviors.stopped. I can say, no, the actor system is gonna shut down now. Because if your top level behavior stops, then the actor system stops. All right, so how does ask work? Ask is one of the places which we've changed the most over the last couple of months. So the problem with ask is, if you're going to ask a question of someone and you're expecting a response, what type are they going to send you back? Because they're probably not going to send you the type that you're expecting, that you're typed to. Like if, you, if you've got a lock service, someone's going to send back granted, chances are your actor is not something which accepts granted. To ask in this example, it takes a few things. It takes the actor ref that you're, you want to talk to. It takes a factory function for creating the message to send to, to that actor, and then a mapping function which can turn its protocol back into your protocol and deal with any failures. And in, in, in this example, the first one I've showed you, because it was such a small example, we, the protocol of the actor that sent the message was actually the same as the response protocol. But in the next one, next one it won't be. So, actor selection is probably the, 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 one of the other biggest changes. So how do you look up actors, either in the same JVM or whether you're in a clustered setting? And that is something called a receptionist. So what the receptionist is, is it's a registry, it's like service discovery, but for actor references. And you can register references, and that, that, that key for registering something contains a type and it contains a name. And then you can either subscribe to get constant updates as new ones of these come up and come down, or you can just ask for a one-off. So you can say, just give me all of the actor references which are registered, which are this type, can receive this type of messages, and I've got this name. So let's see that in, in, in action. So imagine, rather than just sending a lock message to this actor, a completely different part of our system needs to get this, a reference to this, this actor which is representing, uh, representing a lock. And this is its protocol, so it either wants to say the lock actor is available, or it wants to say it's not available, or at some point maybe we're going to get the lock because we'd have sent the appropriate messages. So this is the end goal, right? So we want to receive a message of needs lock, and it's either going to be the lock's not available, and we're going to stop ourselves, and we're going to be very sad, or the lock's granted, and we're going to go and update some global mutable state. We don't really, we're not really going to do that. So how can we do this? So if you're going to spawn an actor and you want someone else to discover it, there's no way to pass the reference, you're not in the same JVM, then there's a receptionist on the context. So that context which is passed to your receive function or your setup function, then you can go to the system, you can ask for the receptionist, and that is actually another typed actor. So you can go look at the types there and you'll know which messages you're allowed to send to it, and some of those messages, you have to put an actor after in to get the response back, to say, hey, here's a list of actors for you. So you register with one of these keys, which is a service key, and then it's got the type and, and the name. And then to find it, you can use ask. So this is an example of ask, where I'm asking the receptionist a question, I'm going to get a response, but me, the person who's making the request, has a completely different type. It doesn't, it doesn't have a receptionist listing type. It's not allowed to accept one of those messages. It's not part of its protocol. So here we actually do map it. 
So that function that goes from the response type of the actor I'm sending a message to back into my type, I'm doing it by saying if it's successful, I'm going to turn it into a lock actor available. And otherwise, if they send me anything else or it's a failure, then I'm just going to turn it into a, a lock not available. And then finally, what do I do if I get that? So if I get a lock not available, um, I can become this new behavior after the, after the previous message. And then I can either stop myself because I couldn't get the lock, so I can't create <coughs> my global mutable state. Um, or I can get the lock, I can ask for the actual lock, because remember this initial one was just an actor reference which represents the lock. And I either want to turn it into what we wanted at the start, which was either a lock granted or a, a lock not available. And then that's just what we started off with. So that one is going to, is it updating? Yes, no, very slowly. So that one basically gets us to the point where we're either going to get in the success case, the lock granted or the lock not available, which is what our initial behavior was, was, was hoping for. And all of this code is like, so I've just put snippets here, it's on a GitHub repository, you can go and run it and you can go and see whether it gets the lock or not. It's a bit of a spoiler it does. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that before I jump on to persistence? Cool. There's, a big, there's, a, there's a big documentation stage of how to interact between typed actors and if suddenly you, you come across a big chunk of boilerplate, there's probably a doc section to say, no, there's this other bit of functionality to, to make it easier. So persistence is the last thing I'm going to show. So who here has used ACA persistence or just done some like event sourcing terminology-ish stuff? All right, so I'll race through this quite quickly because there isn't a huge number of people who are, who are interested. So ACA persistence isn't a general persistence library, it's not like Spring Data, it's, it's, purely decided, it's purely for people who want to persist their data as the events that led up to a state rather than the state. So if you've got, you create a customer, um, a customer registers, you don't constantly update like a customer object in the database, you store the events like customer registered, customer added their email address, customer made order, that kind of stuff. And then you, Im you implicitly work out the state from rope, like essentially folding over, it's folding over the events. Now there is a, an untyped Docker API, which I'm not going to show for this, but the typed one kind of enforces this. So if you want to create a behavior which is actually <coughs> persistent, so you actually want those events to be stored in a database, and if you restart the actor or it moves to another JVM, you rebuild and you get those events replayed, then you use the persistent behaviors factory. You give it a persistence ID, which is just identify it, so it only gets its events back. Uh, you want the initial state, and then you've got to provide two functions. So the first function is the command handler. That essentially goes from incoming message to what should I do? And the things you can do are effect, sorry, it's an effect. You can persist events, you can persist lots of events, you can stop, you can do nothing, you can do any combination of those things, uh, but that function has to return an effect. And there are a set of factory functions for each, for each of those. Under the covers, ACA persistence then persists that event, be it in Cassandra or a you know, JDBC database or a relational database. And then once it's persisted, so once you know you'll get it, unless you have a catastrophic database incident, you get it back when you restart, then it executes the next function, which is the event handler. And the event handler essentially gets the last state, which is initially the initial state. And then after that, it's the one from the previous event. It gets the event that was persisted, and you get to produce a new state. So to define a persistent actor, you just need a couple of functions and you need like three set three types, one for your commands, one for your events, and, and one, for your, one for your state. It also means that if you, if you want to snapshot your state to speed up the replay, you can just say snapshot every thousand messages or so because it knows how to serialize the, the state message, the state type. And that's all I've got for the Archetyped API. I think I'm within, within time. There's a bunch of stuff which I did not include in the, in the talk. So cluster sharding, we've got new API for joining clusters, et cetera. We've got the receptionist. I didn't show the receptionist where you can keep up to date, et cetera. Uh, but we're slowly building up the docs in a slightly different way to the old Docker docs. Uh, there's hopefully lots of small pages that show you how to do one thing rather than like long chapters. Um, so on that note, thank you very much. And you can grab the codes, et cetera, and these slides which are built with SPT and TUTs um, if you want. Brilliant, thanks.